Today, we're going to talk about what is pressure in a fluid and also what is the Bernoulli principle. Now, I've got not one, not two, not three, but four different demos of the Bernoulli principle in action that we'll do. And as you may know, the Bernoulli principle can be used to explain many things, including how an airplane wing flies. So we're gonna dive into that. All right, so for the first demo, I have a regular hair dryer and a regular ping pong ball. I'll turn the hair dryer on and then place the ping pong ball inside and we will see what happens. You can see the ping pong ball is contained in this column of air right above the hair dryer. The Bernoulli principle states that when you have a fluid flowing, specifically it's what we call an incompressible fluid. Air is not really incompressible, but it still works for this explanation because the speed that we're blowing out of this dryer is not very high. Right? When you have a fluid flowing, when the, when the fluid is moving rapidly, then the internal pressure of the, of the molecules inside is actually lower. So once we blow air all the way around this ball, then the air is moving rapidly on both sides of the ball. And because it's moving rapidly, there's low pressure where the air is moving. And since there's air to the side of the ball that's not anywhere near, uh, not moving, then that is higher pressure. So Bernoulli principle states, when a fluid is moving, the pressure is lower. Repeat that. When the fluid is moving, the pressure is lower. And since uh, we have this ball here and the fluid is moving all in all directions around this, this ball, the pressure is lower all the way around it. So because the pressure is lower, the outside pressure, which is higher, is pushing in to the ball in all dimensions. Turn it back on. Here's the first one. And then we will try the second one. Sometimes we can get it to work. And we can see they're both suspended and eventually they'll blow apart. Now, with one single ball, I can usually get it to tilt sideways pretty substantially. Let me go a little bit farther, a little bit farther, a little bit farther, a little bit farther. That's about maybe 10 degrees. A little bit more. Oh, there it goes. All right. And now I'm going to get it right on top and just watch very carefully as to what happens. So what's going on when we put the cylinder there is that the, the flow can really no longer flow around the ball very well. So there's a, a buildup of pressure underneath it. And when the tube is constricted like this, then the buildup of pressure just shoots it out of the top like that. This one has dots painted on it. So you can see a little bit more clearly that the ball is actually spinning pretty rapidly as it gets into the stream here. So here we go. Now, as I tilt it sideways, it'll start spinning pretty rapidly as the stream goes around one side of the ball. Let's interrupt the airflow on the top and see what happens. So we'll put it in the stream, and now I will put my hand on top. Everything looks normal, but as I bring my hand down, without touching it, I'll be able to force the ball down. Notice how it's going closer and closer and spinning rapidly. And finally, it falls out there. So obviously, when you constrict the flow of air around it, it pushes the ball down. Now, the last part of this I'll do is I have a malformed ball. I just crushed it, so it's no longer spherical. Let's see what happens. Here we go. And it doesn't really work very much at all. So if you could see the fluid flow around the ball, you would see it going in all directions all the way around it and forming a low pressure region all the way around. The outside air pressure, which is higher, is then ex exerting a force in all directions towards the ball, and that's what suspends it in the stream like this. I have a plastic bag. It's a very long plastic bag. You see, I can unfold it and then I can unfold it again. So it's very, very long. It's uh, got a hole in one end and the other end is completely sealed so no air can get out. Now, if I wanna inflate this bag with air, usually what I'll do is I'll try to blow it up. Let's see how much progress I can make. Okay, that's three breaths right there. I'm already out of breath and it's really didn't do anything at all. So let me reset and show you how we can use the Bernoulli principle to inflate this thing really, really fast. This time, instead of blowing in the end, let me stand back. One, two, three. You can see that I filled it up there. I can't even get it all on camera, but I'll put it all toward you there. See if you can see that. Again, the secret is take your mouth away from the bag and blow and see if we can separate and make it happen a little faster. One, two, three. 
and there we go, inflated bag. Now what happened in that case? What was different? When I had my mouth directly on the bag, I was trying to use my lungs to fill every uh, cubic uh, centimeter in this thing, all the volume. But when I separate my mouth from the bag, what I'm doing is creating a low pressure region. By using a high velocity out of my mouth, right at the inlet, I can make a low pressure region. Low pressure right in front of that opening draws in air from all the higher pressure air around. You see the higher pressure is like more force, more force per unit area in the surrounding air. And when you create low pressure right at the opening, the air rushes in. So my breath is going in to the cylinder, but what's happening is the lower pressure is causing additional air from outside to fill this uh, cavity here. That's why I'm able to fill it so much faster whenever I actually separate a little bit and blow, creating a low pressure region right in the inlet. The Bernoulli principle for demo number four just uses an ordinary sheet of paper. Here I have a regular sheet of paper. I'm gonna turn sideways and I'm gonna blow with my mouth over the top. One, two, three. You see, when I started to blow, the uh, instead of being blown down, the paper actually rises. Let me go toward you and do it. One, two, three. Okay, we'll go sideways. First, we'll turn it right here. And the, 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 the paper comes up. Here it's pointed up, and as I angle it down, when the flow starts to intersect the top layer is when it starts to rise up. As soon as the air starts, so when I go back up, it falls back down. When the flow, when the airflow starts to intersect sort of the top, parallel to the top, is when we see the paper flutter up like this. When I blow across the top, I'm creating lower pressure. Remember Bernoulli principle, when the velocity of the, of the fluid flow goes faster, the pressure goes down. Okay, and so there's a lower pressure on top, but the underside of this thing has, has no moving air at all. So the normal atmospheric pressure is on the bottom. Low pressure on the, bottom, on the top, high pressure on the bottom means it gets pushed up. All right, now on to our next demo of the Bernoulli principle. I have two balloons suspended from the ceiling. They're just suspended on strings. What I'm going to do now is blow air out of my mouth between the balloons. You would think the balloons would fly apart. Let's see what happens. One two, three. You could see that they actually came together instead of being blown apart. We said Bernoulli principle says when a fluid is moving rapidly, the pressure is lower. So when I blow between it, the pressure between the balloons is now lower. Pressure is related to force. We'll talk about it in just a minute. So there's low pressure here, but all of the air outside has the same higher pressure. Low pressure in the middle, high pressure on the outside means that the balloons are then forced together. So every one of these demos involved a moving fluid, the air. In terms of the ping pong balls, when the, flu when the fluid flow was going around it, the rapid velocity of the air around the ball created low pressure around the ball. The outside air pressure pushing from all directions keeps the ping pong ball suspended. Of course, the impacting air from the bottom gives it a force to stay up above as well, but to keep it contained in the column is because of the forces going from all sides due to the low pressure there. After we did that, we did the two balloons. Again, moving airflow created low pressure and then a high pressure on the outside, the undisturbed air, high pressure pushes the balloons together. And then after that, we did the bag. We blow into the bag that creates low pressure and then the high pressure from around it rushes in with additional air to fill the bag. And then finally, we did sort of, sort of the airplane wing, not quite exactly, just a sheet of paper, high speed air over the top makes low pressure the higher pressure on the bottom pushes it up. So every one of those demos showed moving air means lower pressure. Moving air means lower pressure. Now, a lot of people know that. What we wanna do now is transition to talk about why. It seems backwards. Why would moving air mean uh, lower pressure? We wanna dive into that. So that's what we're gonna do next. So the observation that we had, the one that we wanna really explain, right? So I'll say this is the observation, right? is that when we have a, a high velocity, right, this must correspond to a low pressure, right? Because that's, how, that's the only way we can think to uh, sort of describe it. Or if, or if this is true, let me put it this way, it would explain everything we saw, right? And correspondingly, a low velocity uh, corresponds to a high pressure. All right, here we go. Now, most of us think this is backwards including me, right? Every time, I think it's backwards too. And the reason is when you're driving in a car or a vehicle and you put your hand outside the window and the wind is hitting your, 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 your hand, 
you feel a force, you feel an increased force, right? And so because you feel extra pushing against your hand, we think that traveling fast means high pressure, but it's totally backwards. Tra traveling faster or when a fluid travels faster actually means a low pressure. The reason why it's, it feels uh, 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 increased force on your hand is because you're inserting your hand into the flow and you're, you're disturbing the flow. In other words, if you could measure the pressure inside the moving fluid without disturbing it at all, you would measure a lower pressure. But because sticking your hand in the flow disturbs it, then you, you're, you're basically feeling the force of the air hitting it and disturbing the entire flow in the process. So when you put your hand out the window, the flow is no longer steady and constant and fast. It's ramming up against your hand and that's what, what leads to this counter intuition that we all have. But when we think of the word pressure, as we describe it in terms of being low pressure or high pressure, I want you to replace that word with the following word, collision rate. Temperature plays a factor because if you increase the temperature, then you increase the velocity of the impacting uh, particle. But for all of these examples, like in the room here, all the temperature was the same. So we keep the temperature the same and say, let's pretend there's no change in temperature. Then as the, uh, if the collision rate were to go up, like with the side of a vessel, then we would say there's more pressure. Because pressure, remember, is force in Newtons per square meter. That means there has to be a, a push. Where's the push coming from? It's coming from particles hitting things. That's a push, that's a push, that's a push, that's a push everything's a push. Now when it hits the wall, it bounces off, collides with something in else, and then it comes back, hits the wall again, bounces off, collides with something else, hits again, hits again. This is happening trillions of times a second. If I have a fluid vel velocity low here, I'll draw what's in here, and if I have a very fast fluid velocity uh, there inside this tube, well, let's say it's just crawling along just a little bit. So yes, the particles are drifting this way very slowly, but basically there's a bunch of particles right here. And because they're not moving very fast, then I can, I can you know, ricochet off this and bounce backwards here. I could hit the wall here, come back here. There's a lot of basically, as a, as a group, they're drifting this way, but there's a lot of back and forth collisions still happening. And so what did I tell you? Pressure was the same as collision rate. Yes, higher pressure, uh, higher temperature also means higher pressure in general, but we're ignoring that. We're saying temperature is constant. So then if temperature is constant, higher collision rate means more force, means more pressure. When the fluid is not moving very much, then of course things can move all different directions and I have a higher internal pressure. But if the fluid is now moving and just cruising down at a, at a nice rate, then what does that mean physically? It means inside here, you have these particles which are kind of like, yeah, they can bounce off, sure, they can bounce off like this, but in general, they're going the same direction. Put little arrows here, right? They can hit the wall, they bounce off, they can hit this wall, bounce off, but there's a very fast net flow this direction. And if a fluid is moving fast in one direction, it by definition means that most of the velocities are lined up. And if most of the velocities are lined up in the same direction, they can't be colliding as much because they're lined up in the same direction. I'll say that again. If the velocities are lined up so that they're cruising along more or less in the same direction, then by definition, they can't be colliding very much because they're moving in one direction in unison. It's like being in traffic. If you're in traffic, like very bad traffic where there's a lot of rubbernecking, you're, you brake in front of the car in front of you and then the car moves and you move and you brake and you move and you brake and you move and you brake. You know, you're not moving very fast and so your, your internal velocity of the car as you move and brake is almost like a collision. There's lots of it happening. Brake lights, brake lights, brake lights. But if every car on the road is cruising at, you know, 100 kilometers an hour or whatever it is, uh, and you're just cruising along really, really fast, then by definition, because you're all moving in the same direction very fast, there cannot be very many collisions. Sure, I could go to the side and hit a car, but even if I hit a glancing angle, I'm gonna be kicked back this way and I'm still gonna be making my way that way very efficiently. So when a fluid is moving rapidly in one direction, there cannot be as many collisions, especially sideways collisions and backwards collisions because the bulk of the fluid is moving one way. And because that is happening, there's lower pressure in the fluid. So please drop me a line and follow me to the next one. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.